Dame i gospodo, dobroveče i dobrodošli. Ja se zovem Hasnija Zulić, manager of operations 7 Academy Sarajeva. Večeras ćete vidjeti predavanje The Breakup 1991-2000 Ron Haviv and Christopher Morris. The following content will show the pictures of the world that are required and necessary to show which some people might find it disturbing, but it's too quiet. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. Fairly good number, which is encouraging. Wade Goddard is our uh, handsome friend and a successful war photographer who as he was excitedly preparing himself for uh, this event, someone said to him, wishing him luck, break the leg. <laughs> so the day after, yesterday, Wade fell and broke his leg. Which uh, brings me to me, uh, who I'm, uh, I'm Daniel Gregorich and I'm here moderating this uh, event for you. Uh, while you have me, let me tell you a few more words about uh, uh, me. I run the Bo Photography Museum in Zagreb, which is a private and independent uh, project, which also makes our life quite complex. But our head is still above the water, and uh, we are trying hard. So only two days ago, we installed uh, a advancement in uh, uh, museum technology. We are acting three very strong photographs with uh, professional actors in the form of radio drama. That thing started attracted, uh, attracting great attention. What we are about to have today here is also a sort of reenactment of the uh, life of these two brave gentlemen, Ron and Chris, who came to Yugoslavia in 1990 and were following, continued following battlefields from Slovenia to Croatia, from Croatia to Bosnia and uh, Kosovo. Uh, why are they here? And uh, why did you come here? So this is what uh, we are going to hear, I hope. Uh, let me also tell you uh, a few more words about uh, these two guys. So, who is Christopher Morris? As he was uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with uh, paramilitary, Serbian paramilitary in Vukovar, that guy, without saying a word, grabbed a uh, middle-aged uh, man from this column and shot 20 rounds in his body, without saying a word. Then came to Chris and asked him, and now, what are you going to do about it? Chris did not do anything about it because he feared for his life. But later that day, in a hotel in Belgrade, as they went to a council day, they decided never again to let anything like that happen. Because judgment must go out. And he did, only several years ago, or several years after, came out as a judgment, uh, shot fearlessly with three maniacs. Uh, uh. So, why did you come here, guys? Why did we come here? Good question. Um, first, just a little difference of the story. Ron, after both of us were in Bukovar and there were a lot of executions that went on, um, and all I remembered was Ron telling me that night that uh, 
he was frustrated by the fact that we didn't, we were not brave enough or strong enough to actually physically pick up our camera and document the execution. And I, I just remember distinctively Ron telling me he would never let that happen again. And it wasn't just a few months later that this incident had, uh, incident had occurred and uh, he bravely uh, took the picture um, with great risk. Um, but the, the story begins a little bit before that. So yeah. Chris and I had, uh, had met um, in 1989 when I was a very, very young photographer and Chris was already old um, and uh, very well respected. And Chris, um, Chris and I uh, lived near, near each other. And we were able to kind of talk uh, about stories and things like that. And Chris and I um, had uh, an amazing experience working together in, in Central America, which is another story, but basically Chris gave me a plane ticket to cover a story that launched my career. And Chris and I continued to, to work together uh, for the next couple of years. And when the discussion about the future of Yugoslavia started to come up, and the rumblings of nationalism and so on, it became apparent that conflict was about to break out and was going to break out in Slovenia. And you went uh, before me, so you didn't pick up the story there. Why did you go to Slovenia? I was, I was, it was after the Gulf War, when the uh, invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, they were pushed out. I was on my way to cover the oil fires. I was in the airport in London and I ran into a photographer I didn't know. His name was Paul Lowe. And he told me that there was a war in Yugoslavia on the border with Trieste in Italy. And we had to get, he was on his way to Zagreb to go to a place called Ljubljana. Um, I'd never heard of Ljubljana in my life. Um, didn't know what it was. And I changed, instead of going to Kuwait, I flew with him to Zagreb and we rented a car. And we ended up in uh, the border areas. This is actually, I believe, in Maribor, which is more on the Austrian border. Um, and that was just the start of discovering the breakup of Yugoslavia and quickly trying to educate myself on uh, the complexities of the, the ethnic divide. And eventually Ron showed up, um, showed up in Slovenia, and then it just, it just quickly, quickly escalated. I remember just a quick story. Just as I flew to Zagreb, I had to take a train to Ljubljana. And on the train, there was a young girl. She was crying hysterically. And she was saying in, in very good English, she said, uh, Yugoslavia is dead. First Slovenia, then Croatia, then Bosnia, and then Kosovo. She actually named it in succession. And I naively said to her, no, no, don't worry. The world will never, never let that happen. This will be over in a few days, and everything will go back to normal. And of course, um, she was sadly... Um, exactly right on what was to happen, and that's exactly what um, basically Chris and I did for the following uh, 10 years. It just made me remember, we both had just with an agency called Saba Press, or no, was it Saba at the yeah. time? Yeah. And they had a photographer for Saba, Philippe Corvat, who was here tonight. Um, I had briefly met him during the Berlin Wall, and I uh, knew well of Philippe because he was, he was published Time, Newsweek, of uh, basically the collapse of uh, Eastern Europe. And Ron says, we're going to meet him. And we met him on a highway somewhere between Belgrade and Zagreb. I can't remember exactly. And I remember Philippe just warning us. He says, look, you guys have, the, you know, have a, your, your, your rental car has BG plates. And he, he tried to explain this. There's a we owe, we owe a lot to Philippe on educating us early on so we could survive in the difficult transition of trying to move around and cover, cover the conflict. And so as we all know, the Slovenian War was rather quick and the Croatian War started, literally it feels like it started moments after. Uh, Croatia, we started to experience uh, that conflict, which as many of you probably remember, started off with a uh, majority of Croatian defenders wearing uh, camping uniforms and fighting with hunting rifles and so on, and it quickly escalated to actual real, real types of conflict. 
And it was like this very odd kind of connections between his daily life started to be interrupted by this specter of war, and it became much more radical, much more quickly, I think, than many people uh, expected. The real difficulty was the fact there was no... The only way to find out, you just basically had a map, and the Croatians were very smart because they had a... There were a lot of expats that had come from Canada, and they had set up a press center. They had several press centers. They had one in Osiak, and they had one in Europe, so it was easy to get information from this press center about where to go and how to go, but the problem is, was basically, you know, Places and finding them, and Ron and I never, we never used to of having any translators with us because I didn't want, for several reasons. One, I didn't want to have the risk of uh, the, basically the life of the responsibility of having a translator with us. So we worked without translators. But it was also because the constant moving around was this continuous crossing of lines. So things that normally would take 45 minutes. You would have to drive three hours to go through this, through the Serbian population part, and so on. And it was a lot of driving, which was great because Chris, Chris, the best vehicles uh, from Austria until the Austrian uh, rent a car companies put a picture of him on the window and said, "Do never rent a car to this person again." But um, at the time, um, it was a lot of uh, moving around, and again, kind of. Experience as the soldiers themselves became more experienced and became uh, again things started to, to become much more dangerous on on both sides. Whether we were working documenting the Serbian side or or the Croatian side, we wanted to spend more time on the Serbian side, but it was just a little more difficult to access. They weren't as media savvy, and you had to have because of their command structure, at least with the JNA, you had to have some kind of document. So you can move around. This is in Karlovac during the siege, siege of the barracks in Karlovac. Started going through. But it's, it's also really, I think, just to kind of press again on, on the point that Chris made, it was, uh, it was known actually, I think, quite early on, whoever made the decision on the Croatian side, they actually hired a public relations firm in Washington and they were very smart about kind of playing this role um, of the underdog, which of course they were, but it really enabled the world to understand uh, this, this, the Croatian War of Independence um, in a way that I think that at that point the Serbian side uh, was not able to really understand in terms of allowing access and so on. Um, and it was important still that and I made sure as much as we could, when we could, to make sure that we tried to cover um, both sides in this conflict. So here, this is a photograph, um, this happens to be mine, but Chris has a very similar image. Uh, this is from Okachani. Uh, this is of a Serbian couple actually in their, basically in their backyard, uh, defending oncoming uh, Croatians as they were moving, trying to take over in Okachani. And one of the things, of course, is about photography it has this ability to change statistics and numbers and so on into actual real lives and real people. And while numbers can be skewed in this way or that way, there are still real people that are being affected by this conflict uh, on, in this particular conflict on, on both sides. It's quite interesting how we ended up in Okachani on the Serbian side. We were in Osijek and we knew about this big push by the Croatians to capture Okachani and people here who knows where that is, it's right off the highway. We had left, we were with another photographer. The other thing is to stress, we always traveled in two cars. At this point in the war, we always had to have two vehicles. So we set off with another photographer, John Jones, and uh, Ron and I. And the reason for two cars was because if you lose a car, if you have an accident, if it's shelled or whatever, you don't want to get trapped without a vehicle. So just, just as an added thing, at this point in the war, we also marked ourselves as press we were very evident with TV written all over the car. So at that point, all sides were actually respecting the, the movement of journalists who were not firing on cars um, so, the, to, to a large degree yeah. at that point.
And you couldn't have any, you couldn't, you didn't want to have, for me, I didn't want to have any identification in the vehicle. I didn't want to have any Croatian press cards. I didn't want to have any Serbian press cards. I didn't want to have anything. We would remove the license plates. You would remove all the documents from the vehicle. Um, you wanted to remove any kind of identifying because there was so much suspicion. But I remember that morning we left, we left Osiak before sunrise and we, we arrived at the toll plaza, which was all shot up basically at sunrise. We went, we snaked our way through some, some lorries that were destroyed. We're basically looking for the Croatian positions, but we had arrived so early, the Croatians were all asleep. And we, we round these lorries and before we know it, these guys come out of the bushes wearing helmets with the red star. And Ron and I remember we look at ourselves and we're like, you know, basically, oh shit, these are Serbs. And again, they didn't speak English. We didn't speak Serbo-Croat. We thought we were under arrest. They they took us. They brought us into town. They brought us to some commanders, some headquarters, and they didn't know what to do with us. They had these. Uh, this was in August. Um, it was basically the same time that Yelt, um, the coup in Moscow was. So whenever that was in August. But before we know it, um, actually they put us in a. They put us in a lorry. And they took us up on the mountain. Was this before or after the firefight? This was after. After. So basically, the Cro by the time, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, the Croatians attacked. And we were with, uh, we ended up with the Serbs. And we basically ended up working there for a couple of days. We stayed. And the difficult part was leaving. Okay, now that I'm with, we're with the, you're with the Serbs, we've got to get back to the Croatian side. And I remember Ron and I, we pulled up. This time he got in John's car, and I was in my car, and we drove up to the last Serbian checkpoint. And basically, 100, 200 meters up the road are the Croatians, and they've been attacking, and we want to leave, and uh, they won't let us leave. And, they, uh, and, Ron, and uh, Ron and John turn the car, and they leave, and all of a sudden I look, and there's a soldier, the Serbian soldier's running at the car, and he sees me, and he pulls me out of the window, not opening the door, he literally pulls me by the hair out of the window. Chris had slightly longer hair at that point. <laughs> he, he, he puts me on the ground, he puts his boot on my face, he cocks his pistol, and he puts it into my cheek, and he screams, Ustache, I kill you, Ustache, I kill you. I remember lying there on the road. And this is after we had been with him for two days. And it's like... I all remember seeing John and Ron driving off, and then they came back and... Well, we saw in the rearview mirror, it looked like a cartoon. Yeah. And it was amazing that you could fit through that window so quickly. <laughs> well, whatever, I'm just giving you the complexity of having to go back and forth to each side. And then once they apologized and gave me a clump of my hair back, then you got to get in the car and you got to drive to the Croatian side. And when you reach the Croatian side, you basically got to go through the same thing. So, just to give you an idea of the... The difficulties of covering covering the conflict were extremely extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. Well, I think you're underselling a little bit on this journey because it's a really as you're driving, you get you pull up to the one side, you say, "Could you please stop shooting?" in the hope that the other side will also stop shooting, and then we would drive down the road with the car doors open, our hand one hand out the door. Maybe at one sometimes we'd have a white flag, hoping that they wouldn't shoot at us. This is basically just so we could save four or five hours of driving, and then you arrive on the other side, and they're like, you guys are insane. Like, what, what are you, what yeah, are you we doing? Were, we were crossing the front lines that people hadn't crossed in months. You know, pull up to the Croatians. They would remove the mines, and they would drive. But, you know, you're driving like five kilometers an hour and stuff to, to change, change size. I was with Philippe here. This is in Pakras. Now this is in Vukovar. Ron and I both, we ended up in, uh, in Vukovar. I remember we, we went to Belgrade and we were waiting for permission for, felt like weeks, but it was like a week. And then Dubrovnik was happening and I got paranoid and I said, let's go down to Dubrovnik. I can't remember how we drove down, I believe. Well, we made it to the Serbian lines outside yeah, of Dubrovnik. Yeah, we made it to the Serbian side of Dubrovnik, but then our permission, there was AP in uh, Belgrade, Dushan. What was Dushan? Branich. Branich. He got our permission from the JNA for us to go into Vukovar. This was probably November 15th, 16th. He had our papers, so now we're in Dubrovnik. We had to drive all the way back from Dubrovnik, all the way back to Belgrade. 
and Dushan uh, didn't make it out of Uka or he was wounded. And he had our piece of paper in his pocket and he ended up in the hospital. So we ended up losing a couple days till we could get that paper off of him from Sir John Elitch. And that's when we went on the 18th of November, we finally made it into Uka. But you're talking a little bit, Chris. Yeah, let me, excuse me, let me just sorry. add, though uh, that is not an advertisement, but uh, Radio Jam I told you about, uh, the museum reenacted that uh, scene. But Chris may know something what happened to that guy, do you? From what I've just found out, he was never found. He's, this, this man apparently is one of the missing. Um, they had these fighters we were with, they tossed some hand grenades. A hand grenade was tossed into the basement window. He was flushed out with his wife. They pushed the wife away. He was basically looking you know, I, again, I don't speak the language. Um, well, I did not know that uh, it's sad for me now, and I just went back there a couple of days. I actually went to this actual spot on the wall. You will learn tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Listening to radio drama. The answer, what happened to him? Well, do we know? Tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow we'll find out. But, uh, in essence, I look at it now, why, why as a journalist, why I don't put my arm around this guy, why we don't put him in the car with us, it, it, you know, it's a, a, lot of, a lot of questions to myself. So. But just, just to, this is towards the end, obviously, near the fall of Vukovar, obviously we're at the anniversary, but in, in, in reality, the Chris, Chris and I, along with some other journalists, had been going to Vukovar on the Croatian side uh, for weeks, and it was... You know, the first, you know, the city under siege was um, a story that certainly for the, our American clients, Chris, working for Time, me working for Newsweek, they were not like super interested in it, but we kept going. Um, it was a very difficult place to get into. You had to drive through a cornfield, and as you drove into the cornfield, the Serbian side would be uh, attacking with mortars and, and rifle fire, and then all of a sudden you would cross a point and they could no longer see you and then you would arrive at the, um, the Croatian um, defenders. Just outside Borovo, you would exit near Borovo. And we spent a lot of time um, documenting whatever we could uh, during that time to try to basically raise awareness of what was going on because you had, obviously there were soldiers there but there was a lot of civilians that were stuck in Vukovar and of course Vukovar became a very symbolic um, town. Uh, there's a whole conversation about uh, what the Croatian government did and didn't do. But at the time, what Chris and I were looking at was just who, who was in front of us, who we were spending time with, um, and, and so on. And it was, um, you felt a real uh, affinity to these people um, who were defending themselves against all odds. And in fact, we spent a, a lot of time with a Croatian-Canadian uh, commander uh, of a unit um, who understood the role of the press, and understood what... Chris and I and other journalists uh, were, were trying to do uh, in documenting uh, the siege, and it was um, it was uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and it was quite actually. I have a, one story when uh, Chris wasn't with me. I was with other photographer John Jones, and we had been working in the area for weeks and had survived a number of very difficult times. And we drive through the cornfield, and we arrive, and, and we're there with the, with the commander, and he said, like, welcome, and we're talking about uh, what he was doing, and so on. And, and some shells landed, but not very close, but still loud enough, and both John and I, literally suffering from PTSD at the time, jumped out of our skins. And the commander, who was living the siege 24-7, looked at us and said, you guys have to go home. You can't stay here, because you're in no shape whatsoever to, to spend any time here. And John and I remarkably listened to him, got back in our car, drove back through the cornfield, um, and left. And that, of course, is the luxury that uh, we have, uh, especially as international journalists, that we can leave these places whenever we want, in most cases, when the people, of course, that we're photographing uh, cannot. We would basically work for like a month at least I would put in around three, four weeks, and then I would fly back to New York for like a week or two weeks, regroup, and then come back. 
I had saw John and Ron in uh, Belgrade after this time, and I swear they were so raw, their nerves were so raw, the, there was some waiter had dropped a tray, and the two of them literally dived under the table in, uh, in the hotel in Belgrade, the Hyatt. So you want to just kind of walk us through this situation, Chris? No, there was uh, Ron, Ron and I, we, we were actually with a Serbian photographer, Serjan, from uh, AP. Um, most of the militia, they thought we were Serbs. They did not know we were who we were. Obviously, if we were there, we had permission. Um, it was interesting to me this time was the, I was shocked when I saw, because I had spent so much time in Vukovar on the Croatian side, and I never really saw civilians. A few of the soldiers had girlfriends or wives. I never saw any kids. I never saw any, that many civilians. And all of a sudden, where did all these civilians come from? Where have they been for the last month, two months? Why are they still here? I couldn't, in my mind, I couldn't wrap myself why the Croatians did not evacuate the city. Um, and I understand politically they didn't want to evacuate it because they didn't want to surrender it. Um, but I felt like these civilians were all used as pawns that uh, the government didn't want them to leave. Um, so at this point, there were already, you could find bodies literally, literally in the street. Um, one of the soldiers next to me, Ron went up with Sir Johnny. He was just up the road, maybe around 50 meters from me. One of these guys, it's not one of these in the picture, but I do have a picture of the guy, just not here. Um, he pulled some guy out of the line and he started arguing with him, maybe from two, three meters. He didn't shoot. I it exaggerated when I originally said he pumped 20 shots into him. He didn't pump shots. He probably shot anywhere three to five rounds into his chest. But he basically pulled the guy basically from a meter, two meters away, and just literally just shot him, just pop, 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 pop. And I remember the guy crumpling to the ground, and the soldier, it was literally, we were shoulder to shoulder, and he put his face into my face, like, really, like, scrawled, and I just remembered the smell of alcohol on his breath, and he just gave me that look like, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I remember I was trembling, and I, 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 I wanted, I didn't even want to touch my camera. You know, I was petrified. I was petrified not only for my safety, but of losing my film. And I remember Ron come running up the road because he heard the gunfire. And uh, and I told him, wait, wait, wait. And what we did, we went back later. This is the guy that was executed in front of me. But you'll see there's another body in the corner. Basically, it's almost like they knew certain people or certain men and they would, they would, uh, they were executing them. And they weren't the, they weren't the regular JNA army, they were gone. These were all like militias and uh... Yeah, and so something similar happened to me at some point, I'm not sure exactly in what sequence, but similar line of people and uh, a woman who was coming out as, as a displaced person walked up to one of the Serbian paramilitaries and whispered something in the guy's ear and then pointed to a guy and then the, the soldier walked over, pulled the guy out, and, and shot him immediately. And as I raised my camera, he turned to me and put a gun to my head and said, Nema Shrika. And then that was, uh, brings us to what the earlier story was. Yeah, when and it was, and I got out that night, he was like, we can't allow that to happen again. And it's just really a pretty remarkable, um, these things are so fluid and happening so, so fast. Um, and when you think back now, historically, so many people have no idea like what happened to their family, what happened to their relatives. And these are some of the only documents of, of anything that like is outside the hospital. Ron, Ron and I, we, we, we said, okay, we got to get to the hospital. We got to get to the hospital. So we drove to the hospital, we got out of the car, and there was a lot of, uh, all of a sudden there was a lot of officers, commanders, a huge commotion going on. This is across the street from the hospital. It was like overflow of the dead that died at the hospital. There was no time to bury them, so they would lay them out in the, in the grass. I just remember the, the starkness of the, the fall leaves. Um, and I feel bad. I remember some woman grabbing me by the arm when she realized that I was a foreigner, and she was telling us, don't leave, don't leave. And I remember assuring her, because when we came in, 
we saw the Red Cross buses outside Mukabar that were being held up and I kind of like assured her, don't worry, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, there's the Red Cross, they're going to be coming. Um, I did not know the historical importance of what was going to happen afterwards, but I wanted to get away from the hospital because at this point I probably have, I don't know, 15 rolls of film in my pocket. And my, my, my always my biggest fear because during the uh, Iraq war I had lost around 28 rolls of film. I was captured by the Iraqis and I lost all my material from the... I was so paranoid that some soldier, some idiot was going to take all my material. So I wanted to get as far away as the hospital as I could. And I remember telling Rowan I wanted to find John, the commanders and the units that we had spent time with in Borovo. So I was trying to get over to the Borovo neighborhood. But I think it was a real mistake that we didn't, we didn't spend more time at the hospital. I didn't even want to go inside. I mean, they already had stretchers out. They were pulling stretchers out and putting them on the put him on the bus. The thing is, you all of a sudden some officer sees two photographers. It's like, some. I'm just this fear. Who are these two guys? And that's all I needed. It's like, oh, this guy's Time Magazine and Newsweek is like, you know, get their film. So, you have those fears. <laughs> the reason I have slides, this is not intentional. It's another thing I'd like to stress is I've ignored my archive for 25 years. I have not looked at my photography. I've never made it. The images that you saw of mine that are big, like this one, these are the, there's probably only, of the Croatian War, I probably have 30 or 40 images that I've had scanned. These were scanned a long time ago um, by my agency. It used to be Black Star. I never wanted to go back and look at my material. The last thing, I've just started to go through and look at my material now. And these, I just take my iPhone and take a picture of the slide on a light table. So, Eventually, I need to go through my archive and find this stuff. I've never, I've never really uh, wanted wanted to fa face the work. This is this was in the beginning. This is one of Ron and I, and it was a of a slain policeman. And we drove for we had that we actually we drove into Bosnia for the funeral, wasn't it? Just across the river. Yeah. But I remember we got out of the car and the wailing, the wailing. And um, this photograph, like Chris and I both have a version of this photograph, and so um, when I had my exhibition here uh, in 2001, 2002, uh, this young young man came uh, to the exhibition. And he's now, um, or he was then a policeman, a Croatian policeman. And he said that uh, thanks to uh, the photographs, that at that point there was such an outpouring of support uh, for his family from the Croatian community and beyond that they were able to uh, survive, put him through school and so on, all um, as impact from, from, from the photographs that Chris and I took. And it's one of the times when early on I think that the work actually had some immediate uh, good, good impact. Yeah, time, time music. It was interesting, we were with another photographer and, and when we arrived there was so much grieving going on. He did not take one picture because he felt that we didn't have any permission. Again, we don't speak the language. We just all of a sudden three photographers show up and everybody's grieving and Ron and I, we started taking pictures. And he argued with us that we basically had invaded their their private moment of grief. And he was, I don't want to say the photographer's name, but he was kind of, I wouldn't say angry, but disappointed that Ron and I invaded the space of this family. But actually in reality, I think Chris as well, I mean, I think I've, Sadly, photographed over probably 200 funerals in various places in the world where people have died due to political strife. And I remember in the beginning, not at this funeral, but probably at another funeral in Croatia, um, I was standing like that photographer, not photographing anything. And the father of the child that they were mourning came out of the house, physically grabbed me, dragged me into the house, and said, photograph my child and tell the world uh, what happened? It's, it's like the Syrian boy that washed up on the beach. There was a huge outcry of disgust that a photographer would take a picture of the Syrian child on the beach. And all I know is, if I was, a, if my child was killed or died trying to escape a war, I would want my child's picture plastered across the world to see, because that's that's the thing that's always hurt me was the the youth 
and the basically the innocence. Like here is the innocence, you know, old people, women, children. They're, they're, those to me are the real real victims of all this. Uh, I always, call, you know, the idiots with the guns is the expression I like to use. And then um, I stayed uh, in Vukovar for probably another two weeks or, or so after the fall and just became more and more um, surreal. So here is one of, not a JNA soldier, but a Serbian paramilitary kind of celebrating the, the fall of the city and kind of very odd scenes that kind of continued um, after, after that. Those were the, the, on the 18th were the last pictures I took in the Croatian War. I, I got out to ship my film and I refused to go back. I remember Ron was going back and I was like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to face it. He even called me and said, I was in Sarajevo, I mean in Zagreb and he called me, he says, you got to get to Belgrade, we're going in tomorrow with Sergeant, we're going to Belinja, into Bosnia and uh, I wasn't interested, I didn't go with him. Thank you for calling though. He was trying to get me to drive to Belgrade. This, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's so it's, a, fa it's a father and son. Um, the father fought on the Serbian side for Vukovar and he brought his son uh, to take photographs and show him um, what he had done uh, to liberate the town. Uh, for for Serbia, and they were very proud and very upfront about about the whole situation. It's like the clockwork orange. Moment. I think this for both Chris and I, um, we both have a similar image. We find this remarkable because if you actually look carefully at Christ, there is no there are no bullet holes. But or shrapnel, how is shrapnel. shrapnel? Sorry, but how is that? I don't even know how that's physically possible, given what's behind. It was really, it was really interesting. In 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 June or in July, Ron and I, or early August, the first time we entered Vukovar, we came around the corner. And this was like a, the marker. It was a marker. Okay, there's the cross, and we came back like the next day, and all of a sudden there were like three holes, and we're like, oh geez, where did that come from? And then you come back a week later, and there's like ten more, and it just became, it just like, wow. And eventually it became a, a place that you wouldn't go. Well, uh, you can pick up from here. Sure, so as Chris mentioned, you know, obviously as the Croatian War was happening, and as brutal as it was, the conversation, certainly among the journalists, but amongst most people was that unless there was real intervention uh, from the West, whether militarily or politically, the war in Bosnia was going to begin and it was going to be uh, pretty, pretty brutal. And uh, I came, um, I went to Belgrade actually to cover the deployment of uh, the peacekeepers to Vukovar. And when I did, I got a call from uh, a friend on the Serbian uh, Serbian journalist, and he said, um, fighting has just begun in this town called Bilina between uh, Bosnian Muslims and the Bosnian Serbs. And off we went there, and we spent a few days documenting the fighting. By the third or fourth day of the fighting, this is before the official start of the war in Bosnia. Everybody here recognize uh, this photograph, this man? This is uh, Arkan, who is the leader of a Serbian paramilitary group known as the Tigers. The tiger was, uh, it's a live tiger, it was liberated from a Croatian zoo during the Croatian War. And this photograph was actually taken here in Croatia, in, er in Erdut, where Arkan had his um, headquarters. So Arkan arrived in Bielina, in his words, to liberate the town uh, from Muslim fundamentalists. And I went to him and asked for permission to go with his unit. And he kind of hesitated, and I reminded him that I had taken this photograph that he really loved, uh, he made it into a poster, and uh, he said, okay, go off with this unit, and I was sent off with this group because uh, one of the soldiers was Australian, was an Australian Serb who spoke English, and off we went. And it's a long story, but just to make it very brief, basically they kind of made their way through town with a lot of outgoing fire, almost no incoming fire as far as I could tell. And they wound up in the center of town at a mosque, where if you go back, Chris, one photograph, just go back to this picture. 
This is a man named Harush Zabiri. He's a Macedonian Albanian. He was working in Bilina at the uh, bakery and he was hiding in the mosque and he was captured by uh, Archon's Tigers. He's here being taken prisoner. As they were kind of interrogating him inside the mosque, there was a number of people across the street um, in a house owned by the Shabanoviches. Um, people were hiding in the basement and there was a compound wall and I never went past the wall, but I've now, um, I'm now working on a documentary film called Biography of a Photo about this picture. And we've been able to kind of piece together what was happening and spoke, speaking to people that survived. And so there was a number of people in the basement, including pregnant women and so on, and a number of those people were killed and some of them survived. But they brought out several people. Uh, they first brought out um, the Pajadis, uh, who came out, um, a man and a woman, and they were both screaming, the woman was screaming, the soldiers were screaming, they were screaming at me not to take any photographs, and then they shot the husband, and they shot the wife, and then they brought out, moments later, Tifa Shabanovich, um, and they eventually um, killed her as well. I was able to, there was a truck, parked in the middle of the street, I was able to hide behind this truck and photograph a little bit of that sequence, but I realized that in order to prove without a doubt that the Tigers were involved in this war crime, I needed them in the same frame. And so at this point I couldn't hide, I had to go into the middle of the street. And the street was, it's a very narrow street, not much bigger than from the screen to the second row. And I just wanted to get a photograph of the, them in the same frame. And as I kind of framed the picture waiting for these three guys to come in, this guy who's in the center of the photograph who is known as um, DJ Max. He's a trans DJ in Belgrade. He's a young kid at the time. He's probably 18 or 19 years old. Comes into the frame and I was able to make this photograph. And as you can see, none of them are actually looking at me so they don't realize that I've taken the photograph. And I don't know exactly what I had. Um, and we run up the street and we go back to the headquarters. Moments later, he comes flying out of a window. Either he jumped or they threw him out. I don't know. He actually survives the fall. I'm able to photograph um, him as they pick him up and they pour water over him. They say they're baptizing him. and. So on, and they drag him back into the home. Archon arrives. Somebody runs up to Archon, whispers in his ears. Archon comes up to me, and Archon was very smart, spoke perfect English. And Archon says, okay, give me your phone. I said, why? He says, oh, because I want to see it. The pictures I like, I'll keep. The pictures I don't like, I'll keep. At that point, I realized the film. But I've already hidden in the car the film from the executions. And I don't want Archon to search the car or keep the car. So we begin this surreal conversation where Archon says he's going to process the film and I'm telling him his lab is terrible. I'll process the film. We're arguing over film quality and pushing film and other technicalities to which I'm just hoping that he feels like I'm trying to protect the film in my camera enough that that's all I'm going to lose. And it was this very weird conversation. Um, he lost the film uh, that was in the camera, but I, he never he let me go. And I was able to go straight to the airport and, and send the film. The next day I went back to look for Harush. I went to the hospital, I went to the headquarters, and I never found it. Recently, as part of the biography of the photo uh, project, I went um, to Macedonia. I met with his family and found out that um, it took until 2012 for them, through DNA, through ICMP, to identify his remains. He had been put in, into a river and then into a mass grave and they finally identified it. And it was one of these situations where I had no idea what they, what they thought about me, going back to this idea of exploitation, why didn't I save him, what could I have done? And the family said, 
and it was a large family, and they all said, amazingly, they said, thank you for at least documenting um, and having this photograph, which was used uh, to indict and convict war criminals, um, for it to have some, some purpose. And the same thing also happened with, with this photograph as well. It's quite, uh, quite remarkable. I'm not sure how I would feel. What happened to the men here in the picture? Do you know what happened to the DJ guy? Uh, DJ Max is uh, still a DJ, and the other two guys, it's unclear exactly um, what's happened. I mean, there was a time when we were all working in Bosnia that uh, was wanted. <laughs> there were like wanted posters in the Legion stuff that uh, because Archon was so, because these pictures went around, you know, basically were published everywhere, and uh, um, yeah, this is the beginning. And, Eventually, I was sucked into uh, to going to Sarajevo. This is that initial summer. This is in Mostar. As the Amachi or whatever it is, the Amici. yeah, the victims from Amachi. Actually, six young kids. There's only four here. This is when six kids were killed playing in the snow. So this is a photograph of Senad Madanovic, who is a Fifth Corps soldier. So as towards the end of the war in '95, when the Bosnian army started to um, become more successful, when the arms embargo was essentially lifted. They were taking territory back, so there was a group of soldiers who were basically fighting uh, to take back uh, their villages, the village near Cluj. And this is his home, and he was the only survivor of uh, people in the village, and there was over 60 people that had been killed uh, that were buried um, around, around his yard. And he had took, taken myself and a number of other photographers, Wade Gar and Chil Perez and the men just walking with him and all of a sudden as we were about to leave he just collapsed uh, overwhelmed with uh, emotion of, of where he was and what was and what was happening and um, I recently saw him and he's still still a man struggling to deal uh, to deal with his past um, and then I was one of the first photographers into into the prison camps um, Again, like very strangely, uh, like uh, like in Vukovar, where Chris and I didn't understand why we were given permission by the Serbian authorities to document Vukovar. Same was like why were we given permission uh, to go and document uh, Manjača and Ternopoli uh, when pictures like this uh, existed. But they were important to to document to to tell the world what was happening. But at the time, nobody really cared. It became a story for a few weeks, and then the world forgot about what was going on. And that kind of went up and down throughout the, the Bosnian War for almost four, four years. Um, this is uh, Serbian prisoners being released, being reunited uh, with their families. This is also Mostar. And then this is uh, from Srebrenica, where uh, myself and Darko Bandic and others um, arrived just as the survivors of uh, Srebrenica uh, were arriving. And uh, this woman, um, I've been in touch with her over the years. Um, she lost her husband and her son, and she had just arrived um, within a few hours and was just completely distraught and extremely uh, upset. Uh, with the United Nations. And actually this soldier, uh, I've also been in touch with him, and he's been extremely um, 
remorseful not of his own actions, but of the actions of what the UN, uh, their lack of protection for uh, the victims of Srebrenica. And Sarajevo, as it became unified, uh, the Serbian uh, leadership told that said that all Serbs must leave Sarajevo, and those that didn't uh, were essentially burned out of their apartments. And the Serbians took their history; they took their their relatives, whether they were alive or dead, and took them out of Sarajevo proper. And these are the Americans arriving. And this photograph is um, its a family photograph of the Falco family who lived in Alija, a suburb of Sarajevo. And as the war began, they fled. When they returned after unification, everything was taken from the home. Windows, piping, electricity, furniture, everything. The only thing left sitting on the floor was this family photograph. And I think that more than any photograph that I took, this photograph is what the whole disintegration of Yugoslavia was about. It is about the erasure of identity, it is the destruction of the other, and the meticulous way that this person, I think probably using a razor blade and a drill bit, erased the identity of this very obviously middle class family um, is one of the most powerful evil things that um, that I've seen. And now we move it quickly into Kosovo. And just, just to quickly go through it before we get to a question and answer. What was quite remarkable about Kosovo, um, there was a small group of journalists, myself, Alexander Bulak, Kurt Schwark, Janis Barakas, and a few others that went as soon as things started again in 98. And I was able to um, to work at the White House in America as a ph photographer. I had the opportunity to speak to Vice President Al Gore and get an understanding of what their reaction was um, to the war in Kosovo. And basically what they said was they were regretful that they didn't act fast enough in Bosnia. And when they started to see the same Journalism essentially shamed the United States and Europe into acting much faster on intervention in Kosovo. So within a year, um, NATO forces were involved. And I think that while it's not journalism that was done, whether here, like Chris's picture, um, from the refugees or the violence that was taking place inside, truly shows that at times in journalism, an amazing role. And these are some of the things that we found. This is the remains uh, of a body that was burned uh, by Serbian forces. And these are NATO arriving in Pristina. And then for my last photograph, and the last photograph of this presentation, I, as I said, I was there at the beginning and I was there at the end. So I stood outside Slobodan Milosevic's house when he was arrested and taken the end of my um, documentation of, of the war. Thank you, guys. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you. Uh, it was a little disjointed all over the place. We have, definitely have time for some questions if anybody is has a wherewithal to, to ask. I'm this one up sure. Sure. Come on, questions. To me, there's some 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 powerful images from the war. Iran, Darko Bandic has to me one of the most poignant images was a woman who committed suicide hanging from a tree. In Srebrenica. From Srebrenica. Srebrenica. Um, yeah, questions, please. Well, it's going to be hard to get to that. Uh, were you ever in the middle of the crossfire? Like just in between sh uh, people shooting at each other? 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what What is the feeling? What do you feel at that moment? Do you like? This, is, this like is the wrong place to be. When you would have to bail out of a car in a firefight ditch, and you end up having they took my mic. You end up having Ron <laughs> from across the road yelling, "Are there any pictures over there? Are there? Because there's nothing worse than being pinned down in a gunfight." And you're not near anybody but yourself, and you can't move. You hope you end up pinned down either with a civilian or a soldier. And I remember Ron, just that paranoia in his voice always, are there any pictures over there? Do you remember that? I missed some pictures. I was upset. Yeah, we all missed some pictures. Trust me. Um, what is usually the reaction by civilians when they see photographers at the front of the line? Are they... Um, surprised? Are they? Um, do they ignore you? Like, what's the usual reaction? I think it depends on the situation. I certainly remember as Vukovar was falling, we were the last thing that anybody was interested in on the civilian side. They they had much more important things. I just found out the woman that I took picture from Vukovar with the her two children with the thing. She's apparently hated me for 25 years, 27 years. She couldn't stand me. What was I doing taking a picture of her young children walking by a dead body? You know, and uh, she forgave me and she was happy I took the picture. But for all these years, she harbored this hatred of the photographers there. She didn't look at us as foreigners. She looked at us as... Uh, Serbian photographers. There were actually three of us there. I mean, you can imagine, you've been in the basement for a month, you come out of the basement, you're coming down the road, and there's three photographers taking your picture. It's, uh, it's like, but... Perversion. Yeah, perversion. it's a perversion, but uh, I think they, they understand the importance and the historical value of the, the work we do. Usually fighters and stuff, wherever you are in the world, they're... they're they're so busy, they're not really concerned with uh, having a photographer there. They're, they're there trying to survive and uh, do what their role is. Yeah. Questions? Come on, Philippe, you must have something. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. I think that uh, Croatian war is uh, won by media by three main reasons, and one of these three main reasons are your photos. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And I would just have... So, in general, the public idea of horror of Vukovar is composed by your photos, so... I would have three questions, brief questions for you. For instance, uh, this situation in Vukovar, so it's chaos around you, are you doing this technically and just shooting photos or you are thinking about the composition, the structure of the photo? Because the photos are really nicely structured. So, were you thinking about that or this is just a result of... Ron, no. Ron's very sloppy with his photography. I think more about composition and structure and making sure everything is... This is on the record. <laughs> just kidding. Of course you think about... Uh, you can't just, uh, I mean, there's some photographers out there. I know some very good conflict, conflict photographers. They're actually horrible photographers, but they're, they're very good at putting themselves in, uh, in frontline positions. M myself, it was always, it's, uh, yeah, there's a creative, yeah, you have to frame, you have to compose. Where do you start the edges of the frame? Where do you end the edge of the frames? And, Back then, we're not shooting digital, we're shooting film. You have a latitude, a technical latitude of maybe a half a stop exposure. So you have to be, you have to, you have to set your camera, you have to set your focus. There's a lot going on. Um, it's a lot different now with digital. I feel it's a lot easier, it's obviously a lot easier now with digital. And God forbid if you were working as a wire photographer, or if you were working for AP, Reuters, and all that, you had to travel with chemicals. You had to travel with a whole kit. You had to develop your film in the field, and just the amount of uh, 
the logistics of what we did is it's mind-boggling today because now you you know you, you just connect to your smartphone and off go your pictures back then it was uh ron and i we had to get our film physically out like the day i arrived in sarajevo the first time that summer there was a a massacre you know one of the first market massacres and I had just spent 18 hours driving from Belgrade to get into Sarajevo and on the phone my office in New York is saying bring the film back and it's like how am I going to get I got to get back to Budapest to ship film you know it was a real nightmare of just and you had deadlines and stuff <laughs> of getting film out so yeah but uh, back to yeah composition yeah is important I mean, if you go through history and you look at war photography from the 1930s on, the great war photography, it's all a good structure, good composition. What makes a good photograph? If you make a sloppy photograph, nobody's going to notice it, really. You have to. It's important. The second question for uh, Ron would be uh, this famous photo from uh, uh, this Arkans. Uh, is, th is there a longer sequence of this photo, or you were just had an opportunity of shooting just one photo? No, it's that, it's that frame. Because I was very, um, I was shaking actually while I was taking the photograph. Because I was afraid that they would see it, and I think it would have been very easy. If you've been around when people are killing, the act of killing, everybody is very nervous, and I was very afraid that they would just sort of turn automatically and just, just shoot me. So I was um, very very deliberate. And I, put, I took the frame, I put the camera down, and, they, and just as I do that, I, they, they turned to me. I almost feel that if Ron had not experienced what we had experienced in Vukovar, he would not have probably made that photo. Um, I but I true. remember, I, I just distinctively remember him that night in, in, in back in Belgrade telling me he was never going to let that happen again. And uh, it's, it's great risk when uh, somebody's committing a, a heinous act of murder to pick up your camera and try to document it. It's also, for me, it's important. Like, I, at that moment, believed there was nothing that I could do to, to save those people. Um, they were committing this crime in front of me. I was with them. They knew it. They were telling me not to take photographs. So the only thing left um, was to make sure that there was a, a record of what had happened. And I remember when I was coming, the journalist who brought me to Vukovar, this RTL, they asked me to send them a photo of me working in Vukovar. And the only picture I have of Vukovar, and I'm ashamed to show it, it's me with my arm around a soldier walking down the street. And I'm kind of like hugging him. It's a picture I'm not proud of. But the picture is made because when you're with these people, you can't, it's like a poker game, you can't allow them to think you're there to expose them. You have to kind of be a little two-faced, like you're, you're kind of with them. You, it's kind of like this odd thing of in-bed. You don't want to get into political discussions and all that, so um, I don't know if you remember the, the no. picture. I think you took the picture of me. So it was well composed. It's well composed, yeah. <laughs> But here I am with a, basically a killer, so it's a picture I'm not proud of, and it's definitely a picture I didn't want to have on RTL of me arm in arm with a militia. And again, it's not, I don't like this whole discussion of um, there were bad people on all sides. There were bad people on the Croatian side, there were bad people on the Bosnian sides. There were a lot of bad people on all sides. And uh, for me, it's. Uh, it's this peasant-minded mentality that politicians uh, can manipulate a whole society where they can turn people on each other. Um, it's going on. It's, it, 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 the pendulum has swung back through Europe. It's going on in America. This whole, uh, it's basically in my country, it's like okay to hate again, you know. Um, and that's my real takeaway of basically all the conflicts I've covered in the world. It's basically idiot-minded politicians that are able to whip up a population. Um, I'm not against patriotism, but I am extremely against any kind of nationalism, personally. So just, just, just be careful what happens with political leaders to where 
politicians are allowed to whip up a nation. I mean, my president of my country, it's like, I'm an enemy of the people. It calls people traitors and all that. And it's frightening to me what's happening in, in, in my country just because we're a country with, uh, we have a lot of weapons in our country. And uh, I've always had a fear that if they ever really do try to impeach this guy, that things could really get in get ugly if it went through. They'll never impeach him. It won't happen. Sorry, I'm changing this. Yeah. I would just have the last question. And Sorry. thank you. Both for question for bo both of you. Would you describe yourself at that time uh, of your life as uh, adrenaline junkies? I, I don't think it's that much fun to to be shot at. I do th the one thing. I don't think also that the, for me this is not completely altruistic, because I think the one thing I was connected to and motivated by was this ability to witness history for myself. And in when you look back at the history of humanity, major occurrences often occur during conflict or by conflict. So I wanted to be able to witness that and I wanted to, I appreciated the privilege of being able to show you my interpretation of what's going on. So that part of it I thought was amazing. But do I miss being shot at or do I want to go back to a conflict so, so, so I can be around near-death experiences? For me, no. It's not, uh, it's not very interesting. And soldiers are not very interesting because it's really the more important things are what's happening down the road to the civilians and the other things that are going on. Um, so while I understand this kind of cliche version of the adrenaline junkie photographer running from place to place, I, I don't see that with myself and I don't see that with most of my colleagues. There are some that I, I had seen it, but those people disappear very quickly. Even, even if it starts maybe as like a bungee jumping, then responsibility prevails immediately when you're confronted with uh, scenes. I think if you understand why you're there and what you're doing, <coughs> it is an amazing responsibility it's a, to be able to, to be there for the eyes of the world and to try to have impact. Um, and when you do have impact, it's, it's, it's pretty overwhelming uh, and it's rare. So it's that, I think it's that constant desire to try to have your work have some meaning besides just for yourself. If it's just for yourself, it's it's it's, it's voyeurism. It's not it's not interesting. Okay, here. Uh, hello, Ron and Chris. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I actually didn't know that uh, you were the authors of these photographs. We've seen for many many times. Uh, so now we had a chance to hear from you your own stories. So uh, what I wonder is like, uh, how do you constantly get a chance to photograph Serbian army, exa example Arkans, when you take uh, pictures of them actually, uh, you know, putting them on a trial, committing war crimes, and you're documenting it? How do they give you this chance to constantly be there with them? They made a mistake. <coughs> I mean, really, I don't know. I never promised Arkan anything. He never asked me to promise anything. In his case, I think he thought he was smarter than everybody and that I was there to glorify his uh, cause on an international level. And I don't know, it was, it was, and he was very angry. I was, as Chris mentioned, I was put on a list and spent the next uh, eight years trying to avoid him. Um, but strange, these, there are strange things that happened and of course, What's happening today is that people are much more conscious about the role of the photographer. And it changed during, during Bosnia. So I mentioned earlier how we would have TV on our cars and be able to cross lines. Towards the end of the Croatian War and by the beginning of the Bosnian War, um, if you put TV on your car, that meant somebody was going to shoot you because they wanted to control the messenger. And the entire conflict in the former Yugoslavia had killed and wounded more journalists than any other war since World War II at the end. This was a, a sadly the number has been replaced by um, loss of journalists in, in Iraq and Syria. But it has become indicative of um, this attempt to try to control. Um, but there are times when people, their egos and so on, they think uh, it's okay. And I think that it's also this conversation about, you know, we are there to document history and 
we're there to hold people accountable for, for their actions. And if they let us document that, then so much the better to hopefully avoid other people from doing the same thing. Thank you. May I ask you just one more question? Uh, since you, uh, you said that I didn't know about the, the technique that you're constantly switching the sites, I thought that war photographers always go with one site and they stay. So uh, is there any similar, uh, similarities and differences between the sites when you change? Like, do you know which site uh, is a, a aggressor and which site is a defender? Do you see anything similar or different? It just depends. In, in Okachani, the service were the defenders. It just depends on where you are in the in the battlefield. But it is rare in a conflict where you where you switch sides. In the Chechen conflict, you could cover the Chechens, and if you could get permission from the Russian government, you could go and cover the Russian side. It just uh, it's usually when there's a government involved, a structure by, like the American military or something, it's very difficult just to show up with a camera. They have a structure involved. You have to get permission and a lot of work. But if you're dealing with a... Some but, but, even that, but even that's like, if you look at the 2003 invasion, there were photographers that were on the Iraqi side. There were photographers um, that were embedded, myself included, with the Americans. And there were photographers who were working freelance kind of not structured with anybody, trying to cover whatever they can. Each of these conflicts, I think, is very specific onto itself. But it is our attempt, if we have the ability to do it, to try to document as many sides um, as possible. But in terms of, by the time the Bosnian War occurred, um, Sonia Karadzic, who was uh, Karadzic's daughter and was the press, head of press, was so anti-Western press that she basically shut down any attempts uh, to document what was happening on the Serbian side. And in fact, actually, after the unification of Sarajevo, when we went over Babica, which was the Serbian side of Sarajevo, the destruction there was equal or greater to some parts of Sarajevo on the Muslim side. But none of us ever saw it because they never let us go over there. I was arrested in Malaysia. I had given my film to a German crew that was flying out of the airport, and they... they, they take a vehicle, it was a Ukrainian UN vehicle that would take you to the airport, an armored vehicle, and at the Serbian checkpoint they found my envelope of film and it basically said Serbian shells kill six kids or whatever and they were arrested and I was going to go grocery shopping at the UN PTT at the airport in my armored car, I showed up and all of a sudden there's my film and this German crew that had spent the night at that checkpoint. They were so happy to see me, and they're like, it's his film. And the next thing you know, I'm arrested, and I was taken up to Pali. And their big gripe was me, was why don't you cover the R side? You know, we got the same thing. And they basically gave me permission to go work on the Serbian side and all that, but I wasn't having anything of it. They let me go, and I drove back down to Sarajevo. It was difficult to uh, cover the Serbian side, in, uh, especially in Bosnia. They became very savvy because of Ron's picture. So okay, you're blaming me. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Well, I just want to say one last thing. The power of photography where a photograph can change the world, it's very, 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 very rare. I've done it my whole career, and I've not made one photograph that has caused any change. Ron has had around two or three images that have changed and moved governments um, from Panama to hear the pictures we looked at from, uh, from Bosnia, even all the way to something with uh, Clinton in America. Um, it's a very unique thing that Ron has accomplished with his photograph. It's, uh, it's kind of hard in history where you can actually make a photograph that can stand the test of time, that can change, change history. And uh, that's what we all strive for in our work. But it's a it's a rare a rare feat. So, hats off to the young kid that I brought to. Well, you are responsible. So thank you. All right, so we are we are good. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Danilo, Image of War Museum. Those of you that have not yet gone, and those of you that are watching live, if you come to Zagreb, I encourage you to come uh, and and look at the images. Um, in this museum, and your motto is? War belongs to a museum.
Yes, it's spreading, as you can see. The audience, the audience say it audience. again on the microphone. War belongs to a museum. War belongs to a museum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ron and Chris. Thank you very much.